Um, so while everyone's thinking about the questions, um, maybe to get started, uh, something that we're all kind of talking about in our breakout rooms, uh, I'd love it if the panelists get to think about or speak about how they define an emergent behavior or maybe to instantiate that a little bit more. Uh, could there be an example from your work that you think of like, this is emergent behavior to me? Uh, are you asking everybody or, or, the, or the group leaders of this uh, breakout room? Um, so we, I love it if the, I mean, everyone's welcome to join in, um, but it'd be great if the, the panelists could maybe provide their thoughts um, as well. I can get started unless there's some speaking yeah. order here, um, just to break the ice. Uh, so in, in my, actually you had a very lively discussion already in that little breakout room, and what it came down to is the question, what isn't emergent behavior, right? Because if you specify an optimization objective, there's going to be, something's going to emerge and that's the solution to this problem, right? So if you have a room with a robot and the goal and then the robot goes to the goal, that did come off the process. And then the argument was, well, if it's something surprising, right? Emergent behavior is something that wasn't entirely obvious given the objective. So this is typically when you have an objective that's like somewhat underspecified in terms of the solution space that come out of it, right? In particular, in something like an adversarial setting where, you know, you have go and you have a lot of like very, very complex moves that come out of just a simple objective of trying to beat the opponent. There's something about, you know, how much information content is in the objective and so sort of like how broad is that distribution of strategies that could come out of it. And then each of them is sort of an emergent behavior because it carries a lot more information than the underlying objective did, right? So if you have relatively simple dynamics, a simple goal, and then you get very, very complex behavior by some measure. And then the crux of this argument was, well, but actually if you did know exactly what the optimization process is and exactly what they're optimizing, da, 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 then you should never be surprised because you know exactly what the things that could emerge out of this. I mean, the, like the, the problem requires information gathering. Congratulations, the agents learned to, uh, to gather information. The problem requires communication, and then they learn to communicate what an emergent surprise, right? So there was a little bit of this tension between, and then there was a, another discussion that was about like dynamic assistance that could we use something like that to understand how much complexity, so to say, like was generated along the process. And, that would, and then there was another aspect which was, hey, how does this differ from reward hacking? Reward hacking is an emergent behavior, but not one that we want typically. So there's something about like this typically we imply by emergent, we, we mean surprising and wanted behavior as opposed to surprising and wanted behavior so that's a very, another very subjective judgment here so we had a bit of like trouble of you know drawing the lines without implying invoking human judgment um maybe i will pitch in add a little bit to what jacob here is saying is that um i think emergent behavior need not necessarily be surprising to be useful so i think um the other way where it can be useful is just allowing you to underspecify the details. So if you just want a robot to do something, you can just tell it at the high level what to do, and you don't have the burden of, of specifying all of these details. The fact that the robot will pick something up is, is not going to be surprising, yet it is still very useful. And I think like, this also holds for um, multi-agent or social behaviors that um, they need not be surprising to be useful. Yeah, I think on that um, topic too, it's kind of a, a long running problem, I think, in the sort of philosophy of emergence to try to define it in some way that doesn't depend on just surprise. Um, because, you know, there are these, um, basically, if you have a good enough model, then nothing is surprising. Um, it's just like, we currently don't have the model that allows us to predict the consequences of, of these choices. So like, you know, I think it may help to bring in a kind of classic example of emergence, which is uh, like Conway's Game of Life, where you define these very simple rules on um, on a, a cellular automata, um, and you get all these very complex um, kind of macro scale uh, dynamics emerging out of it, um, and it's like that's surprising to us, but it's it's sort of a deterministic consequence of the. Um, of the underlying rules, it's just, um, yeah, so like, can we define it in some way that isn't just sort of like psychological to, you know, the, the viewer? Uh, 
I can maybe add to that a little bit. Um, I thought about it in, in very similar terms to what Jacob was describing, that the moment I, ha I set up an, an optimization criterion and the robot figures out what the policy is through whatever means it does so, um, that's an emergent behavior, right? Because I didn't have to handcraft that. Um, um, and whether it's surprising or not, it doesn't matter because that's kind of in the eye of the beholder, whether you were able to compute through that yourself and solve that optimization problem and could anticipate it or not. I mean, I don't know what I anticipate might be that, you know, I might, I might not be able to anticipate all the things that Jacob would anticipate, right? I have no idea. Um, but um, kind of along the lines of surprise and to add to what Igor was saying, I think that a lot of these, a lot of emergent behaviors are very useful and we would call them emergent without being surprising. And so, for instance, um, um, one of the examples the, from, uh, from what the Dorsa did with me back in her PhD was cars inching forward at intersections to do info gathering, right? So, I mean, the objective had info, info gathering in there. So that's, you know, the fact that the car would do info gathering was not a surprise in, in any way. And inching forward is something that you could anticipate as that that would happen as, an, uh, as a result that would emerge from the optimization. Um, but it's still an emergent behavior, I would argue, um, and it's, it's, it's kind of this, it's a strategy that we didn't have to go and handcraft in. We didn't have to go and tell the car, look, you can do this kind of maneuver, maybe parameterize it in some way and say, try it out, you know, see what, see what happens, see if it actually helps you to your objective. No, we did the actual optimization directly in the raw action space, and this kind of emerge, I'd say, as a strategy. So the way I try to position this, um, at least in my head, the way I've internalized this is that there's kind of a spectrum of how, how, you, how much you handcraft something, right? You can go all the way from specifying the actual motion. And there might be some examples where you have to come up with primitives, um, for instance, info gathering like primitives. So folks in manipulation would do move until touch, for instance, as a primitive that you could, that, that, that the robot could then actually plan with. Um, uh, versus, you know, you could define the POMDP and then the robot goes and figures out the version of move until touch or whatever that makes sense for, for the task. Um, and so I think there's, there's a spectrum there and it's, I don't know where to kind of draw the line. I guess where I drew the line internally for myself is when you're, you have a raw action space and you don't come up with primitives and parameterize it. But that seems like a subjective thing because what's the raw action space? Because, you know, how do we decide that the control space for a car is steering and, and acceleration dash braking? Um, that was a design decision in itself, right? So, so I, I think I'm a bit fuzzy too when I say that, but I just wanted to point out that it's not necessarily about surprise. I think, I think, but it, it, everything I think is an emergent behavior and some things we have names for and some things we understand and some things we don't. Yeah, and for maybe following this line of thought, but maybe, maybe uh, putting it slightly differently, um, that when I hear that term, I, um, emergent behavior, I think of, well, what is the relevant layer of abstraction for actually predicting and explaining behavior in the system? And um, I, what comes to mind for me are the, um, uh, these devices that the philosopher Dan Dennett at Tufts um, popularized some time ago, um, but to describe from the perspective, not of the engineer uh, building the agents or entities in the system, but um, as an observer, <laughs> um, trying to predict and explain um, why entities are behaving the way they do, that you can adopt various stances towards them. You can you know, adopt a, a physical stance to explain how a watch works. Um, but you might um, need to, or you can, um, you know, try to think of this device in terms of um, their properties as just physical materials. Um, but you may be more useful to go one level up and think of it as a designed object that it was clearly engineered for a particular purpose to tell the time. And so adopting design stance to think of it as a designed artifact is actually more useful and predictive. And that I think the proposal, um, this is just a, uh, uh, channeling that perspective just like a way to think about it is that when when reasoning about um and predicting and explaining uh the behavior of intelligent autonomous systems it can be useful to think of to take the intentional stance that these agents um have goals beliefs and desires <laughs> um in in some fashion and it's actually uh less useful and more cumbersome 
to adopt a purely physical stance to try to understand how a person is going to behave, say, on the road or when crossing in a busy train station or in all these different contexts where you really interact with lots of people. And so if you really, if, if the goal is to predict and explain um, the behavior of these entities and system, I think the idea is that if you can explain those entities without recourse to the other elements of the system, you're probably not looking at something emergent. But if you basically can't explain its behavior, sort of simply and compactly without recourse to its like it's um being embedded in that system that is inter interconnected in various ways more likely than not you probably should be adopting that higher level of abstraction and looking at something emergent i think that's a really excellent definition um and i think um yeah i, I think that that also comes through when we're thinking about multi-agent systems and and human robot interaction, um, where I think emergence is something, and this is really well put by um, David um, in in our breakout room, um, something that comes from the interaction between agents as opposed to properties of agents themselves. So it's sort of something you can't explain purely by how you've designed a particular agent, but it's something about how you put them in an environment together um, and and the kind of channels of interaction they have available to them. So it's sort of the relations between entities rather than entities themselves. Yeah, I was going to reply to Judith. I think this is a really nice point of view, but I do want to draw the line that if you hunt design beliefs and desires into an agent where you specify here's the controller, here's the exact belief that this agent will have in every state, and here's exactly what the agent does in every single state, right? Where there's nothing that is about this agent that came out of the interaction of learning between multiple agents, or there's something that came out of the interaction at all. Then I would be on the set of Robert of saying, well, that probably isn't the beliefs and so on. They are a good level of abstraction, but we built them in. And therefore, at least the way that I use the word emergent, I wouldn't call that an emergent property. I would say that, you know, only when those things come out of the interaction, out of learning, out of something that we didn't entirely manually specify, then it's an emergent property, in at least the way that I use the word emergent. Even if you build in really sophisticated capabilities, I think, you know, some of these are, are beyond the current state of the art, but like, say you were to build like human-like intelligent systems, like there may be, and we would expect quite unpredictable consequences of those, uh, uh, of those, like they may behave in unpredictable ways. And probably the simplest example, just to crib, you know, Robert's example from a moment ago, the game of life, it's, you build in the rules, the rules are very simple, right? And yet the actual downstream behaviors can be quite unpredictable. And it's those, I, I think there isn't the same tension that uh, I, I see these different, um, um, views as being uh, possible to reconcile as just being different perspectives on the same kind of, uh, you know, problem that on one hand, they may be surprising to us if we are, you know, designing these systems and then they behave and they go beyond what we did explicitly designed them to do. And then that can bring about <laughs> feelings of surprise on the part of us as like engineers and designers. Um, but I think as an observer embedded in the system or as like a participant or entity or like agent embedded within the system, I think what can be useful is to think of the, all the kinds of behaviors that like arise as a, as a function of our being embedded in that system, as opposed to being uh, behaviors that are um, determined just by our properties taken in isolation can be like a useful way of like separating different kinds of behaviors of interest. Makes sense. Um, just to follow up on that, in our breakout room, we were talking about physical human robot interaction and sort of how these systems interact and what maybe humans can inject to change what the robot's originally trying to do. Um, and so I had kind of a specific question. It made me think of a more specific question for Brenna. And I was wondering, do you actually see these types of emergent behaviors in assistive systems? And do they actually come up in interactions with human in your experience? So I would say that we would like them to but for exactly the reasons that have just been discussed about how much you actually program into the system, um, it's probably falling a step short still of what um, Jacob was talking about, certainly in terms of an emergent system. So we build in ways to adapt to the human, um, but we know what we're paying attention to uh, because that's just 
where we're at, right? That we, we kind of know that we need to pay attention to X, Y, or Z. We know that we have sort of formulated the control sharing between the human and the autonomy in a certain way, and that we're sort of limiting the rate of adaptation so that it's still going to be anticipated by the human um, and it's not going to surprise them. All these sorts of appropriate ways to share control mean that it's still fairly controlled on our end as designers. Um, we would like for it to be more open-ended in the future, um, but also probably another another good point uh, or like salient point to bring up is the fact that most of these systems have not gone out into the wild yet. So robotic wheelchairs are not out in the wild. Uh, robotic arms are to a certain extent. Yes, just honey, just a minute. Sorry. <laughs> Um, robotic arms are to a certain extent, but not without, with any autonomy. So the Canova arm is probably the most widely disseminated at the moment, but it is not disseminated with autonomy. And so those are tele the, the, where we are introducing autonomy to physically assisted machines. Um, the, they are, it's introduced to a machine that currently was designed to be 100% human teleoperated. And those are the versions that are out in the world right now. And I think until we have these systems out in the native environment of people, and see how they are being used, not just in a one-off or two-off setting within a controlled environment, uh, we aren't going to see the real spectrum of the variety of interaction that is going to sort of cause these emergent behaviors, but something that we would come, would come closer to what Jacob was talking about in terms of what, what an emergent behavior looks like. So, you know, we've taken the first step, but uh, we still have quite a, quite a bit to go, but I am certain that we'll see it once, once we've gone further. Great. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so uh, maybe quickly add to the to the last couple of points that, that Brenna and Judith were making. Like this, the design stance actually does seem to somewhat be in tension with uh, the emergent behaviors because um, if the behavior is uh, unpredictable, you are lessening the human's ability to take the design stance towards our artificial agents. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Yeah, I guess one segue, um, you know, the conversation we're just having made me think of two kind of paired questions uh, that we were thinking about before, which is you know, when we put these systems onto the wild and these emergent behaviors occur, who really stands to benefit from these emergent behaviors? Are they, do they pose a threat? I don't know if threat's the right word, but are they unsafe in general or can we, I guess we've already said if they are unsafe, we don't want these emergent behaviors, but you know, who stands to benefit, or maybe we, can we talk about more about what we might expect from these emergent behaviors uh, out in the world as we deploy these systems? I want to talk about a little bit of, about the basics of who stands to benefit, um, because, and this is, this is in particular kind of based on this, this very broad notion of emergent behavior, which is something that you didn't program it, right? That, that somehow the robot, um, uh, that emerged in the robot out of its, its learning or, or planning or decision making or otherwise. Um, and I think that basically everyone stands to benefit from that. Uh, and it's actually kind of a requirement because uh, if you don't do that, if you instead, if we instead are, you know, in the space where we have to spell out for robots how they're going to interact with people that look, when you do this, you have to exaggerate your motion. And when you do this, you have to add anticipation. And when you do this, you should inch forward. And in this case, inch forward by, you know, this much. And in this other case, do this other thing and back up over here, but not over here. That that becomes a zoo of interaction strategies that you have to not only come up for each type of situation, but also specify somehow or give a robot a way to figure out how to vary it across each, you know, and like every intersection you put a car in, you know, that, that behavior has to be slightly different and you have to be able to deal with that, right? So I don't think that we're going to get the scalability that we need in order to deploy these robots out into the world, interacting with many different people in many different types of situations without embracing emergent behavior from this perspective, right? But I think, Dylan, you're getting to this point of well, at the same time, if it's emergent, we sometimes it's surprising. And sometimes it's surprising, you know, Jacob was saying in a positive way, and we kind of like to call that emergent behavior. But what about, you know, the freaking like boat doing a loop collecting turbo booster points uh, because the reward was points in the game? Like, how do we, what about that? And I think that, you know, to a certain extent, the moment you go towards autonomy, the moment you go towards specify the objective and let the robot figure it out in every new situation, 
you, that, that sort of thing, you're, you're opening yourself up for that. And I think you have to open yourself up for that because otherwise you're kind of designing in everything and that's not scalable. Um, but, and to me, I, I, it's not going to surprise anyone who knows what I've been talking about for the past like three years, but to me, that's like, that is very much about, you have to commit to that, but you have to make sure that you get those darn objectives right, right? Like you, you can't, it, very careful about it's not just an objective that I set once and I you know I tested it some and then it, I deploy it and then I just hope that that incentivizes the right behavior so it incentivizes the correct emergent behaviors the positive surprises you can't you just we don't have the tools to do that and I think uh, you know that's been really exciting for me over the past few years is how do you make tools that end up doing that so that you get the emergent behaviors but they're actually the, the good ones the ones that we like the ones that we would look in hindsight and say oh yeah good idea robot I wouldn't necessarily have thought about that but I'm I'm glad you figured that out. And if I, if I can add to that, a really interesting, um, uh, Anka. Uh, so if I can add to that uh, from, uh, from our perspective, um, just to, to avoid that, maybe uh, that, that there's all kinds of undesirable emergent behavior that uh, happen without us being able to influence it. Uh, so we, we design a lot of human machine interaction and interfaces to actually uh, ensure that you can understand what the robots will do and can to some extent influence their behavior on the spot or perhaps their goals to some extent. And so then actually the complexity uh, increases even further because then you also have the human adaptations emerging in interaction with the emergent interaction from the, well, and then I just stutter. Yeah, so uh, there you go. <laughs> I had one point when I was listening to Anka, very, really interesting points, Anka. Um, well, who benefits? I, I fully agree, almost everyone benefits, but what about the hundreds of people who are hunt designing autonomous car systems to inch forward in that case and then break in that case and be, you know, there's always this, there's always a group of people that will probably not benefit because they have expertise in hunt, de hunt designing systems. And I think ultimately, I think, you know, we all agree on the goal, which is we want to solve harder problems by doing less hunt design through emergent behaviors, but ultimately the success of emergent behaviors is measured not by us saying, oh, that's a cool behavior, whatever. I think ultimately success is measured by being able to solve tasks that we couldn't solve before doing the hunt design or whatever else it was. And, you know, then we benefit because we can suddenly solve tasks that we couldn't do before. We could do it more reliably or easier, but obviously those people who have been hunt designing it as always um, may see the expertise no longer be required. But in some cases, so I agree with that, Jacob. Um, I think in the, the good news is that I think in, in some cases, or maybe quite a lot of the cases, their expertise is actually very valuable. That I think in a sense, we're being too cavalier if we think, I found that I'm too, let me, let me speak for myself. I found that I'm being too cavalier if I say, here's the objective and this is the model of the human with these parameters that you learn and go robot go and then it will deal with everything. That oftentimes you kind of, you need to look at what people have been maybe uh, have been finding that they need to put in and then say, okay, well, let me take, you know, 10 steps back and see what the abstract away from this and figure out what, you know, what I would need to put in as part of the objective and as part of the dynamics of the system so that I can cover all these different situations with one, you know, kind of clean, cleaner system. Um, and, and so their, their expertise is, is very much needed. And, and I think in interaction as well, like if, if you think back to the legibility work that I did back in my PhD thesis, right? It's not like, so, okay, so the robot figured out how to exaggerate the motion, blah, blah, blah. But it's not like if work on intent expressive motion didn't happen at all before that, it's not like we could have done that work. It really built on top of folks who had been putting their really creative, you know, design skills to use, understanding domain, understanding the interaction. And then we came in and said, well, okay, is there a way to be able to do certain things like this autonomously? Um, and, and I think it'd be way too cavalier to, for us to think that we can just, you know, write it down, do RL, and then everything works out. I think that's right. Um, I think. But also, yeah, conceptually, I, I agree. Uh, with what you're saying, Anka, about uh, the emergent behaviors or putting in less um, allows you, I think, democratize this technology uh, and basically lowers the barrier to entry for uh, multiple people to uh, 
to be able to take advantage of what uh, robotics and autonomous control has to offer. Um, I'd say the flip side that we should be careful about is um, I think the ability to audit these emergent systems. Uh, because we've seen that, I think, uh, or at least they're seeing some results that in other uh, applications of AI that have social impact, uh, for example, uh, say AI systems that decide uh, that make parole decisions, um, the ability to make sure that they are being used properly has been uh, ability to audit them. And that's really what uh, was able to convince policy is just very careful auditing of how these systems make decisions. And um, I think, you know, technologies we develop will also have social impact and I think keeping ability to audit them in mind uh, is also important. Okay, great. I think all those are really like exciting points. Um, and they actually got some people thinking in our discussion. So just a reminder, if anyone has a question, we have Slido as one of the options to like talk, interact. Um, and also you can raise your hands in Zoom. Uh, and myself and the other uh, panelists or, or organizers will help uh, get, get those questions asked. So one that we have that was kind of popular, um, so I'm Siddhartha, and it's for all the panelists, and it is, is our goal as roboticists supposed to be to design robots that create emergent behaviors or have emergent behaviors? Or is this emergence just a nice byproduct to robots? So is it a goal or just something that's nice to have? So I think it depends on what the task is. And I, I think that um, there are a number of tasks, especially in interaction and multi-agent situations where I think there's really no getting around it because fundamentally the task is about something that's not under the, the designer or robot's control. It's, it's like how they interact with, with other people. And um, I think the kinds of, you know, so, the kinds of things I think about a lot are things like coordination, um, which are um, kind of fundamentally about what the other person is doing and you have to meet them there um, where they are. Um, so inherently, like, because the way that you coordinate is going to be a property of both of you, um, like, the emergence is, is part of the task basically um so like you can build in something into your objective which is like i want to do something about what um you know based on the input from from the other agents um but like what comes out of it is always going to depend on what that other agent is doing and that's like not under your control so i think that that's like those kinds of tasks i think are useful to think about um when thinking about like the limits of of non-emergent um, um, behaviors, I I agree with Robert. I'd say my answer would be that it's not technically the goal, but it seems to be a required property if you want scalability. Because in interaction with people, you could go and try to handcraft everything, but like I was kind of trying to illustrate before, you end up with a very massive uh, you know, kind of, you would end up with this huge decision tree of in this situation, this and this other situation, that, and and, and you you know you never you can never really push uh, to to covering all the situations that the robot will need to see. And I would actually argue that when we're talking about interacting with humans, even if the robot's behavior was held fixed and not adaptive at all, you would still have emergent behavior because you would add up, have adaptation on the part of the human. So when we're talking about interaction with humans, at least we are going to see emergent behavior, whether we like it or not. Um, and sometimes it's going to be explicitly the goal and you're going to actually build in, the adaptation in and sometimes it won't be because it's not, it, it just doesn't make sense in that context, but you will still see it. I think I partially made my point earlier when I said, ultimately, I would never think of the emergent property as a goal in its own right, but I think of it as something that is a tool towards solving other problems that we couldn't solve before. Right. And sometimes it's too hard to measure the actual goal to say, well, I want to make progress on like self driving cars or whatever. So we're going to test it in some test case where we can check for this property coming out. But ultimately, I think down the line, the bar is going to be, can we, by thinking about emergence and emergent systems, solve problems that we couldn't solve with other means? Right. That's ultimately the goal. So, and in that case, 
you know, no, the immersion was just a stepping stone. We do like we want to do is solve problems that we couldn't solve before using other means. Right. And then there's a question like, what are good problems like benchmarks that can hold ourselves to responsible, to be accountable, to being honest with ourselves. We are actually making progress on those hard problems that we can't solve otherwise. Because I think otherwise it's very easy to confuse the, the stepping stone and the actual goal, right? Often when you do this kind of reward shaping, then we overfit to the reward shaping function. And that's what happened to ourselves. If we just start optimizing for emergent properties without actually checking, do these things help us to accomplish anything that we couldn't do before using other means? Very true. And I think um, the answers, especially Brenna and Anka's answers, actually uh, sort of address one question that also just came up in Slido. So sort of focusing on the human side of these emerging behaviors. Like we've been talking about how robots can learn things, but what about the humans and how they maybe learn new things or come up with new ways of solving these different tasks? Um, and maybe taking that one step further, the question that we were also thinking about is, do you guys have any sense of what types of algorithms or ways of programming the robot are best for or most conducive towards uh, creating these types of emerging behaviors. Um, and that could be in, in sort of cognitive science or even linguistics or any sort of context. Um, what sort of algorithms do you think are most conducive to emerging behaviors? So I'd actually take that a step um, back even, uh, even more fundamental. So one thing that we think about in my work is actually what sort of signals should we be adapting to in the human? So especially if the human is someone with motor impairments whose interface for operating the, the robot or the assistive machine is quite limited and has limited in information flow, the question of what signals you should be paying attention to, is it that you're actually taking their um, teleoperation of the robot as a demonstration, or is it just sort of a crude, is it a correction, or is it sort of just a crude instance of you should have done this, or you shouldn't have done what you did, but maybe the person can't actually do exactly what they want the robot to do, or they can't actually tele teleoperate the robot to do that. And so it's not that you're actually going to take that at face value, it's just as an indication of something that's wrong. Is it okay to query the person and say, did you like that, did you not? And based on the kind, and obviously these, kind, this, these sorts of information flows or these sorts of signals are going to be amenable to different algorithms. So if you have a demonstration, use the supervised learning algorithm. If you have an indication of yes or no, maybe you're using that as a reward. And so, um, so to a certain extent, what kind of information you can get from the interaction uh, will determine the sort of algorithm that is appropriate. Yeah, I wanna plus one that uh, Brenna, I, I, I think it, it, it's, it hits the nail on the head that, um, you know, you, you, you hear Dylan's question and, you know, what immediately came to my mind is, well, we have to use some game theoretic tools because like, that's the way to model these crazy interactions, blah, blah, blah. Right. Yeah, of course. And then Jacob would think of, well, we clearly need to like do this in a multi-agent RL system because that's going to, you know, lead us to these emergent things. Um, but one thing outside of that is whenever we commit to these things, we commit to some state and action spaces. Right. And I think what, what Brenna is saying really resonates with me that a lot of the times what, you know, what that is is not clear. Um, you know, we've, we've been for years figuring out more and more sources of observations about what people want. It's like, well, you know, Dylan did corrections, right? It's like, oh, I, the person can just correct me. And then, you know, someone else came in and said, oh, if you can just look at the state of the environment, then because people have been acting in it, that gives you information. And so you, I, I, think, I think a lot of times we think about the tool and that narrows us a lot on the, what our, you know, state action observation definitions are. Um, I'm just wondering if uh, this type of uh, design stance that uh, Judith brought up can help us here. Um, and of course, I agree, like the, there can be limitations on what interfaces humans, uh, how humans are able to feed us uh, these the systems information. But uh, could it be that, you know, in many cases, humans will just adapt and make do with what they have? And so getting this type of observation space exactly right might not be that crucial because humans will be able to yeah to co-op to what they have I'm just wondering about that i think that's a really interesting point in particular when it's about adaptation um so maybe having the most capable robot at adapting to humans human level adaptation is not the optimal answer 
because sometimes breaking the symmetries where it's clear who's adapting and who isn't makes coordination much, much easier, right? So, the, the, you know, the, we can easily come up with games where the equilibrium of robots are stubborn and kind of robotic and humans are adaptive is going to work much better in a variety of coordination games than having both sides try and adapt at the same time because then you have this, like, you know, this meta problem of breaking the symmetry. And, you know, this would be a little bit of a disappointing outcome because it means anyone who's pushing in the direction of like more adaptive, smarter robots, ultimately what we need is just, well, just make it clear to the humans that robots aren't going to adapt to you and this you've got to deal with it, right? I'm, it's a little bit of a devil's advocate here, but I, I, you know, I think it's something interesting to think about at least. I think that's, that's somewhat right, Jacob, in full information settings. And then when you're starting to add in, oh, but what is the task and what are the human's preferences? And I have to kind of, you know, customize what I'm doing to what the person actually wants. That's where you're starting to get into, uh, you know, well, okay, so if the task is specified, then maybe the human, you can just do it in a way and the human can adapt. But if you don't know what the person really wants, um, then, then you're getting, then it seems like leveraging different sources of observations and so on might not be necessary, but might end up with, uh, you know, getting the robot to be much more capable of doing what it's actually supposed to be doing much more quickly. I want to jump in right here just to make sure we, we get all the questions, some of the exciting questions at least that we're, we're having from the audience. Uh, and one that is, I think quite good and several people have supported is this idea about multiple time scales. So obviously emerging behaviors could happen quite quickly or they could happen over a very long period of time. Um, and maybe a quick answer about how important is it to continually learn and adapt um, so that these desired behavior, or sorry, these emerging behaviors uh, occur over these different time scales uh, during the interaction. So um, I think that this is a really terrific question. And I think that a lot of what I've thought about is how these timescales are linked. So basically how rapid adaptation over shorter timescales facilitates or um, sort of has downstream consequences for longer timescales. And that like, basically it's not clear what other mechanisms can lead to long timescale um, coordination or adaptation other than local mechanisms. So um, I think that that's sort of the research question in, in a sense is like, how are those timescales connected to one another? Um, and how can like, basically, like, what can we do over short timescales that, um, that like, can lead to these broader uh, changes? Um, Okay, great. Um, so I know our time is a little short for the panel and we'd love to also have um, some spotlight talks after this. So just to close out the panel, um, I'd love it if all the panelists could speak about their final thoughts on emergent behaviors. Like where do we go next? Uh, where do you expect to see emergent behaviors in the future? Um, what, it, what it really is the future of this field? And I love for you know, everyone's perspective on this. Yes, it's definitely a question you have to consider. <laughs> so I guess I can just uh, jump in and start in a very uh, narrow uh, application domain, which is, uh, or like very narrow context being specific to my application domain. And I think that what's going to happen next is out in the wild. And I can't say exactly when it will happen, but I think that it's going to radically change things, especially as we consider things, um, going back to this question of who is going to benefit. I mean, this is going to be the, all the stakeholders who do not have expertise in robotics or computer programming. They are the ones who stand to benefit from emergent behaviors. And they are going to be the ones interacting with these systems, certainly at least in the case of human robot, um, human robot systems. And so um, exactly what those interactions will look like is going to change wildly once we are out of the labs and out of factories and out of control settings. Maybe I can go okay. next. Go ahead. Okay, no, I was just going to, um, I guess, register a, 
um, a plug for basically the role of cognitive science and human-human interaction for understanding what humans are doing better. Um, essentially, I think that a lot of the kinds of emergent behaviors we're interested in robots humans do with one another um, already. So like human-human interactions are full of emergent phenomena. Um, and a lot of the recent history of, of kind of social cognition and um, social interaction, especially in language um, and, you know, um, like the way that people adapt to new circumstances is sort of full of lots of interesting examples of surprising emergent things happening um, that like we don't have control of the objective function obviously in these cases like we can't um, you know do reward shaping or, or uh, tweak that but like trying to understand and model those kinds of interactions and how those things arise and the kinds of mechanisms in people's minds that are are leading to those um, those outcomes, I think, um, will give us a, a sort of stronger foundation um, to inner interactions with robots um, and between robots. So, like, just for example, like people are people bring a lot of priors into social interactions. So, like, um, if you have a a human interacting with um, a partner who's um, a child um, or, um, you know, basically depending on who their partner is, they adapt in very different ways. So it makes sense that if you partner them with a robot, which is a, another very different kind of thing, they'll interact in other ways. So like understanding the beliefs that they're bringing into these interactions. I mean, th this is stuff that's been going on in human and robot interaction for a long time, but just like understanding that human-human um, -human dynamic, I think, is is a really powerful theoretical um, basis. I think I had something actually very related to that, so I'm glad you went first, Robert. So um, the the way I'd, I'd phrase it from my side is a lot of the successes that we've had, including from a lot of people on this panel, have largely been successes where you see emergent behavior by implicitly or explicitly modeling the person as a robot. And by that, I mean, you model the person as doing RL, you model the person as doing planning, you model the person as doing Bayesian inference. There's all these tools. So we kind of pretend like the person is another version of a robot, maybe noisy, optimal, whatever, but, but variations on that. And I've, it's taken us quite far. I'm, I am very surprised by how far it's taken us and the, the kinds of things that we've been able to, to show. Um, but I, I kind of foresee a, uh, that we're going to hit some sort of wall with this, right? And so what I wonder is, you know, people have all sorts of cognitive biases. We know about this. Behavioral economics has yelled at us about this for decades now and has identified uh, this, this kind of Pandora's box of systematic biases that people have, which are largely right now at the level of kind of hacks and heuristics. Um, they're not, there's very little, you know, kind of principled, there's some with some of these theories, but but for the most part, it's kind of observational. It's like people do this in this situation. And the the thought of needing to put all of that somehow into, you know, the model that we're giving the robot is very daunting. The thought of not putting any of that in and having the robot kind of learn in the wild via real interaction with real people, also daunting. And so finding a way to get to get a little closer from where we are towards more realistic modeling of, of, of the human when that's actually necessary. Because, you know, for some situations actually not necessarily been necessary, but by finding a way to say, okay, the person isn't the robot. How do they defer? How do you bring in so that those real human characteristics in? Um, I think that's exciting and daunting at the same time. I was going to say along these, I was going to make two points. So one of them I think I touched on earlier um, being transparent about what types of emergent behaviors or maybe learned capabilities is another way of framing this we're interested in and why we're interested in them and then testing that when we accomplish them we can solve other tasks right I, I would expect if we keep going on this research agenda to see a lot more 
empirical evidence, here's a task that we agree is hard and that we can now make progress on. So that's sort of like the, the housekeeping, you know, as, as, as a community, I think there should be transparency around what we're doing, why we're doing it. The second axis goes towards what Anke was saying. I think um, self-play works really well, for example, like two players, your sum, and it doesn't work anywhere else, right? We have to seriously think about what kind of optimization process objective, yada, 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 actually leads to human-like behavior, right? And this has to do with the cognitive abilities, it has to do with objective function, it has to do with uh, other algorithmic details of how do we process beliefs, what kind of counterfactuals thinking do we do, do, we do yada, 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 a lot of things. But what I would love to see is to learn how to do this in a more task agnostic way. How can we go from task specific data that you have to then learn something that's a more general principle of human algorithmic decision making or of human problem solving, right? So this could be that there are like some biases we have that are like evident in different tasks, but that are present in all of them, right? So that's where I would love to see the transition of going from like, let's learn how to coordinate with a human on a specific task to what are the general principles of human coordination human decision making and can we learn those from task specific data that's given to us but in a more general way. So here's where I think like circling back to the point that Brenna made at the outset which is really pushing on the frontier of task complexity. I think this is really important both in cognitive science for understanding human human interactions but also human robot interaction and, and I think that this is something that certainly in my sub area uh, my community has like suffered from for decades is like overly fixating on very simple toy controlled tasks <laughs> in like very you know simplified environments with like very artificial objectives and i think if we really want to make progress we're really going to the only way we're going to really distinguish the different algorithms and systems that are under consideration is to really push them and like really use tasks and possibly separate them and to really elicit the kinds of like interesting uh human um uh, surprising behaviors that you know will actually force us to actually make theoretical progress too um and i think that like breaking out of the lab is like a really important first step and and i think that like our communities by that i mean like the robotics community as well as the cognitive science community can really like work together <laughs> to like broker that transition in like a productive way and i think that that would be like a really exciting like direction to pursue um in tandem So I think that um, Igor, if you had anything you wanted to add, we'd love to hear your perspective. Oh, uh, yeah, apologies about the delay on this. Um, yeah, I, I think um, I do agree that getting robots uh, or getting these systems out in the wild, because like, we are seeing that a lot of advances in AI in general, I think like would be happening from integrative uh, efforts and integrative works. And I do think that, um, we are somewhat handicapped by the actual tools and the cognitive abilities of our agents right now. And I think we will see more uh, advances as we keep working on improving those. Um, so maybe this is like a somewhat boring answer, but I think like uh, we should be expecting, uh, like seeing the increase uh, in what our agents can do and um, expecting that to influence the social and emergent behaviors that, that start coming out. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say that's a boring answer. I think that does a good job of summarizing a lot of the different things that we've been um, discussing today in this panel. Um, so with that, I'd like to close this part of the workshop and thank all the panelists again for all your um, great input, great insight. Um, it was really excellent hearing all of your different perspectives. Um, so thank you so much. Also, thanks for the questions from the audience.